Hello, welcome to your favorite integrated science revision show for senior high school on joy learning. I am George Loco, your facilitator from St. Mary Senior High, Kualigono. Today, we will be looking at some questions and answers and then a few areas that we are yet to study under the revision science show. So we have three sections today. We shall be looking at a theory and a skeleton. Then we have questions and answers that we shall address. And then at the last part, which I know is your favorite, shall be the problem of the day. So at this juncture, I think you might want to invite a friend and they can also watch on our social media handles at Joy Learning TV. So to start, let us look at our learning objectives for today. Learning objectives for today. So at the end of this lesson, you, my favorite learners, will be able to identify parts of the mammalian skeleton and state the functions of the skeleton as a whole. So if you were to state the functions of the parts of the skeleton and then that of the whole skeleton. And then state the functions of the parts of the skeleton and identify and describe the parts of the axial skeleton. So we shall be looking at the axial skeleton. And the fourth point is apply your knowledge in at least five topics in integrated science in solving questions. So that we shall be looking at when it comes to the second part that involves solving questions and some questions we shall discuss. And the last bit is to solve the problem of the day. All right, so you might want to invite a friend and they can still watch us live on YouTube or Facebook at Joy Learning TV. So let us look or move right away to our first concept for the day. Now, the animals on the face of the earth, whether vertebrate or invertebrate, have developed some complex system of communication. And in mammals, which we are considered to be the most advanced, we have a highly developed brain and we are also warm blooded. So if you are sitting by somebody and you touch the person, you see that the person's body is warm. And the person, you cannot see the brain because it's enclosed in the skull. But the person can think and reason. And it's because the person has a well structured reasoning structure called the brain, which is hidden in the skull that forms part of the skeleton. So in order for mammals to obtain food, shelter, as well as mate, they move from one place to the other. And the structure within these mammals that allows for movement are a rigid skeleton. Then we also have a tissue which contracts. So here we are looking at the muscles that helps the, the skeleton to move as a result of their contraction and relaxation. Then we also have a supporting surface on the ground or the air. So it means that for you to move, you need a skeleton, you need the muscles, and you need a surface on which you have to work because you need friction to help you do so. The human skeleton is made up of bones, which could be fused or free. And the fused bones include the bones of the pelvis, that is the waist region. There are some bones there which are fused together, forming an interesting small cage. And the skull, all right, the bones in the head, or what you call the cranium. Muscles are attached to bones directly by means of what you call tendons. So anytime you are served with chicken and you are eating, as you rip the meat of the bone or the thigh bone, you see some white tissue attached directly to the bone and we call them tendons. Some of the bones are large while others are small. So showing on your screen is a simple picture of the bones in the pelvic region. The one that helps us to walk around the waist region. And these bones are fused together. When they separate, we cannot walk again. So it is important they remain fused. Again, we have the bones of the skull. That is a, the cranial bones. And we have different shapes and sizes. But collectively, they form the shape of our faces and the dimensions of our head. So if your head is big, then it is the nature of your skull, all right? So don't blame anybody. It is how you were made or created. 
So let us look at characteristics of mammals. Characteristics of mammals. Mammals, we know they have skin containing certain glands like sweat glands, mammary glands, and sebaceous glands. The sweat glands are in the skin. We also have the mammary glands, all right, and the sebaceous glands, which are also embedded in the skin. Mammals have what we call fur or hair. So you and I, we have hair on the head in certain portions of our bodies, but some people are more hairy than others. But in addition to humans, we have other animals that have fur, very very thick coat on their skins. All right. Most mammals have external ears, so you see that you have uh, what you call the pinna, the left and the right, and they are funnel-like, so they receive information or sound from outside and focuses the vibration inside for processing. And you can hear me as I am talking to you. All right. So mammals have skeletons, what we shall be looking at today, or bones to which are attached muscles for movement. So here we can see that the skeleton performs a major role of movement, but it has other functions as well that it plays. And mammals have two sets of teeth which appear in succession. These are the milk teeth and the permanent teeth. We have already taught this um, in our previous lesson. So you can go to YouTube, you can go to Facebook at Joy Learning TV and you have access to this information. The types of teeth of mammals depends on the type of food they eat or their diet. So if you look at the teeth, the dentition of a cat is different from that of a goat and it's also different from that of we humans because the type of teeth we have in our mouth determines what we eat or it determines our diet. Okay. Now they have a well developed brain. So mammals have a well developed brain and sense organs. And the thoracic cavity of mammals are separated from the abdominal cavity by a diaphragm. So your chest region, the 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 the, the chest region has a cavity inside and the abdominal region also has a cavity inside but they are separated by a flap of tissue with smooth muscles referred to as a diaphragm. Now mammals give birth. That's an interesting thing about mammals. And they give birth to your live young ones, a process we call viviparity. Viviparity. So take note of that. In the case of birds and reptiles, they lay eggs. So we say they are oviviparous. All right, oviviparous or oviviparity. Now, female mammals suckle their young ones. So, when you were young, you were taking breast milk, and it's because mommy gave you breast milk and you were suckling. All right, so we look at the structure of the mammalian skeleton. After looking at the characteristics of mammals, we want to zoom further into the system that helps us to move around, all right, and to perform other roles. So, we are looking at the mammalian skeleton. And the skeleton is a hard part of an animal that forms a framework for protection and support of the body. So it forms the harder part of the body. It is, in the case of man, it is inside. It protects certain organs, all right, like the brain, like the heart, like the lungs. And in addition to that, it supports the body. So the entire weight is supported by the skeleton. So it's like a building. And the iron rods are the skeleton supporting your weight. The skeleton gives the body its shape as well as supports the body and facilitates movement in mammals. So how you look is exactly how your skeleton looks. But it's not only the shape, it helps you to move around, all right, and perform other roles within the ecosystem. Now, the mammal skeleton is found inside the body. And hence, it's called an endoskeleton. It's called an endoskeleton. So the skeleton that we find inside the bodies of animals is called endoskeleton. The ones we find outside the bodies of animals is what we call exoskeleton. We shall be looking at it in the jiffy. So the skeleton is composed of two tissues. All right. The skeleton is composed of two tissues. The tissues are the bones and cartilages. So you have the bones, all right, tissues of the bones and tissues of the cartilages, which are formed by living cells. So it means that your bone is made up of cells and the cells are alive. Unless you die, they continue to remain living. And the same applies to the cartilage. 
these tissues contains minerals all right such as calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate so the tissues which we are calling the bone and the cartilages are rich in calcium phosphate as well as what calcium carbonate the bone itself contains lots and lots of um, calcium phosphate bones by nature are hard rigid and non-elastic so it means that your bone cannot stretch it may have its own tensile strength but it cannot stretch like the way we have this elastomers or what we call the elastics you cannot stretch it otherwise you look like amoeba like um, a balloon filled with water and you'll be rolling so we thank god for that structure now cartilages on the other hand are soft all right less rigid and slightly elastic so you have them in your ear the pinna all right so if you hold your ear it's not that hard it has that rigid shape but very soft okay um, sometimes i remember when we were in primary school our primary teachers used to pull our ears but now it's forbidden it's not a good thing so let's look at endoskeleton the skeleton found inside the bodies of mammals or animals so you see that this is a type of skeleton found enclosed by flesh inside the bodies of mammals examples of animals which possesses an endoskeleton are mammals like you and i uh, like humans like monkeys cats and rats okay reptiles all right what you call snakes lizards they all have this type of what skeleton their skeletons are embedded in the flesh so as you move around you can't see uh, uh, the skeleton of a mammal unless the animal or that mammal is dead but we can also have other animals whose skeletons are outside all right they are outside so we have a grasshopper shedding its exoskeleton so you see if you look at that of the grasshopper um it grows out of its um skeleton its skin and it comes out a process we call egg disease or molting in biology so in this case it leaves behind the exoskeleton that hard material that protects the structures inside so the exoskeleton the skeleton rather is formed outside the body and the soft tissues are inside the skeleton but in the case of mama the skeleton is inside the tissue and is protecting other important organs or structures inside the body so let us look at exoskeleton all right exoskeleton now this is a type of skeleton that lies on the outer part of the soft tissues of some animals examples of animals possessing exoskeleton are like i mentioned the grasshopper you can have cockroaches insects generally have exoskeletons and then you can have mollusks like the snails right the octopus and then you can have crustaceans like the lobsters the crabs the shrimps these are all um, organisms or animals with an exoskeleton but this example showing on your screen is an endoskeleton of a fish so if you are given fish you see that the skeleton of the fish is inside the flesh unlike the grasshopper that i showed earlier whose skeleton is on the outside so again we look at another example of an endoskeleton and this is the skeleton of man or human beings all right and we find it inside the body uh, unlike the insect whose skeletons are outside our skeletons are inside and it will only show when the animal dies and decomposes all right and it will be showing so let's look at general functions of the mammalian skeleton general functions of the mammalian skeleton so like we said earlier it is in the mechanism of what breathing apart from support it helps the body to breathe so without a rib cage you cannot breathe and here the skeleton performs a role in helping you when it comes to breathing the skeleton also provides a framework and the shape of the body so like i said earlier your body your body shape is denoted or defined by the skeleton and the skeleton supports the body's weight which we mentioned earlier now the skeleton protects soft delicate and vital organs of the body so for example if you open the skull of an animal you see what you call the brain it is so vital very soft and yet does a lot of things for that uh, organism's body 
so here the skull is protecting the brain and other organs like the eye the eye is hiding in the socket of the skeleton and you may also have the heart all right which pumps blood to or it's like the uh, pumping station of the waterworks pumps blood to all parts uh, of the body so examples of such organs are the brain the kidneys the heart and the lungs when these organs are not protected you can guess what will happen to that animal it means that that animal can easily die or will be dead the skeleton provides surfaces for the attachment of muscles so for you to move freely from one point to the other or to pick a phone and call your friend that uh, joy learning is is beaming live on tv for the revision show you need muscles attached to your bones and that will help you move your hand to pick a mobile phone and also make that call the skeleton enhances movement in all parts of the body's joints and in locomotion so when you are dancing when you are jumping around when you are we are very happy and you are running remember it is the skeleton that is helping you perform this role or function the skeleton provides surfaces for the attachment of muscles which we mentioned earlier the bone marrow of the long bones are responsible for the production of blood so without the skeleton means that you will not have blood produced in the body and the blood producing cells can be found in the marrows of the long bones like the femur or the thigh bone right the hand bone those long bones are responsible for performing that so sometimes when you eat chicken and you break the bone apart you see some tissue inside the bone all right and that is what you call the marrow so the skeleton stores minerals all right such as phosphorus and calcium because it contains minerals which gives the skeleton its rigidity it is also a reservoir of minerals so when you are eating you are, you are served with um, the the chicken that you like all right remember to chew the bone because you get a lot of minerals from it that will add to what you have and you'll be stronger so we have a label diagram of a human skeleton showing on your screen a label diagram of a human skeleton showing on your screen i want to do that briefly then we move on to functions of the parts of the skeleton so if you look at the skeleton of man you have a head sitting on a neck and you have a torso an upper region you have a pair of hands moving through the back then you have your hips and your legs also descend okay the bone in the head is what you call the skull all right the skull and the ones in the neck are what you call the cervical vertebrae collectively we have different vertebrae all right vertebrae that forms the column and we call them the vertebral column we shall be dealing with them very soon but we have your hand all right we have your hand attached to your arms attached to a triangular piece of bone at your back so sometimes when you move your hand in a certain angle you see the shape coming out that is what you call the scapula all right and the scapula together with the clavicle the collar bone articulates with the bone of the hand okay so you have what you call the humerus that is the upper part of the hand then you have the lower part which separates into two bones the ulna and the radius well at the finger level all right from the ulna and the radius we have set of bones then it descends into the fingers so you hear of what you call the carpals and the metacarpals and the phalanges all right we'll be looking at them one by one part by part as we move on in the course of time well from here we move on to the bones that forms the hip what you call the pelvis and the ones that forms the leg they are similar to what we have in the hand in terms of um, the way they look but they perform a different role in the case of the one in the thigh we call it femur which is similar to the humerus in the arm okay in the arm and then from the femur we have the knee or what you call the kneecap or the patella or the patella and it also separates further down into two major bones one is smaller and we have a major solid one the smaller one referred to as a fibula and the major one as a tibia as it descends further you have your foot and again you have a set of bones you have the 
metatarsals, you have the tarsals, then you have the phalanges. Uh, again, forming the two uh, bones, all right? So you have what you call the phalanges. So that basically sounds a part of the mammalian skeleton. This is integrated science. You are not supposed to go extreme. You are just supposed to summarize the parts of the bone. So with biology, you'll be taught the detailed structures as you move along. So let's look at parts of the mammalian skeleton and we'll be looking at the functions as we move further. So the mammalian skeleton is largely divided into two main parts, namely the axial and the appendicular. The axial constitutes the skull and the bone that runs from the skull to somewhere around the back of the pelvis. So they form the axial skeleton. All right. Then appendicular forms the suspensions. That is your hand. All right. Those structures that you have your hand attached to, and the structures that you have your legs also attached to. So here we are looking at the pectoral and the pelvic girdles. All right. So the limbs as well as the girdles. So we shall start right away with the axial skeleton. Well, the axial skeleton consists of the following parts, like I said earlier, the skull and the vertebral column, what we also call the backbone. Now, showing on your screen, it's a typical axial skeleton of humans or of man. So you see, we have a skull. This is the skull. And attached to the skull are uh, these bones which runs uh, from the skull to, so you have the skull and you have this bone that runs at the back, not the one in front, but at the back. So let me use this one. So you have the skull and the one, the bones that runs at your back, a very long forming, very long canal or chain that ends at the tail. So if you check the very back, then you have this, the back of the skull also running through all the way to the tail bone. All right. So that forms what you call the axial skeleton the axial skeleton so we move on to the first part of the axial skeleton referred to as the skull the skull is made up of small bones fused together to form irregular edges referred to as sutures so with sutures you have different bones and they fit together all right they fit together so you have zigzags and that is where they meet we call the sutures this forms the case called the cranium that is the skull so you have pieces of bones fusing to form that round thing which can house the brain and those structures form the bones that fuse forms a structure we refer to as the cranium or the scalp and that is where the brain is highly protected or that is where the brain hides and it is also referred to as the brain box the brain box the snout all right the snout or face and the mandible or lower jaw so the skull consists of the pieces of bones that form the round thing forming the cranium then you also have the snout all right that is the upper part of the yeah the lower part of the face then you also have the lower jaw what we call the mandibles all right collectively they form the skull remember there's an upper jaw referred to as what the maxillary all right we'll be looking at it only the mandible or the lower jaw is movable so if you look at the skull of man, if you look at this skull, we have the entire skull, then you have the lower jaw bone attached to the skull. So the skull is at the top and the lower jaw bone just moves up and down on side to side when it comes to crashing of food. So on your screen is a picture of a typical human skull. And like I said, you have bones which are fusing, we are fusing and they form what you call the sutures all right so we have the snout that extends a bit forward so your head is not typically round like a football you have a portion of it and then the other one extends or distends then we have the lower jaw bone referred to as the mandible so here we have the skull made up of those bones and then you have your snout or the facial bone then you have your mandible but don't forget for this human skull we have the part where the human eye or the eye fits all right so we call it the eye socket so it's like you plug it in the eye socket also known as orbit then we also have the nasal cavity where your nose 
all right it's attacks we have the laser cavity then apart from that we have other bones which you are not supposed to learn so we just have to know the skull the eye socket or the orbit the laser cavity the lower jaw bone or the mandible and then the upper jaw bone or the maxillary there are a lot of bones about 206 in all and you are not supposed to learn them okay so the the few ones that you are supposed to learn is what we have summarized for you leave the rest for the science students and those who want to enter into the field of medicine so we move on to functions of the skull so we are looking at what the skull does for the body all right or the skeleton well it provides protection for some sensory organs of the body such as the uh, sensitive organs or sensory organs of the body such as the eye the inner ear and the tongue and nose for smell all right so you have the eye the ear the inner part the ear that you see has two uh, has three regions the outer the middle and the inner the inner one is protected by the skull so sensitive and also the skull determines the shape of the head so like i said if your head is very small then your skull naturally is very small but if your head is also big be glad all right because you are wonderfully and fearfully made then the skull also provides protection for the brain found within the cranium and it provides surfaces for the attachment of the facial muscles so when you are smiling when you are crying the way your face looks is because of the uh, uh, the contraction or relaxation of the facial muscle there are so many of them and the skull gives them that surfaces for attachment and give us that shape all right when you are exp expressing emotion or any other thing so we move on to the vertebral column all right the vertebral column this consists of pieces of uh, rigid hollow bones all right that that fits together to form a very long column so you see that the vertebral column also referred to as a backbone is made up of a series of irregular short bones known as vertebra all right now if they are plenty we call it vertebrae all right that's why we call it the vertebral column so short bones known as vertebrae these are arranged end to end forming a hollow tube through which the spinal cord passes so it's like you have my hand here as one of the bones the other one as another so they fit and as they fit you have a hole running through it and we have the spinal cord an extension of the brain connecting to all parts all right of the body there are 33 vertebrae in man so if you look at the bones that start from the the base of the skull all the way to the tailbone there are in all 33 vertebrae in man the vertebrae have a general pattern with slight modification at certain portions of the column performing specific functions so if you look at it means if you assemble all the vertebrae the bones of what you call the vertebral column or the backbone they look similar there is a there's a general trend but as you move from one region to the other you see modifications all right so the bones of the chest zone are a bit different from those in the neck they are also different from those around the abdomen or the pelvic region now each vertebra is separated from each other by a spongy disc known as the intervertebral disc so you see the, the creator made it said that if this is one of the bones and then the other one is there they don't touch the, the, the surfaces don't touch um, directly there's always some spongy tissue separating them and one of the functions there is to um, absorb shock so when you jump and you land you will not have extreme shock all right uh, it also prevents wearing of the surfaces of the bone but some people have problems with that when you go to the hospital they will help you to diagnose and they will help you fix them so if you are not feeling fine don't go to places that are not supposed to go go straight to the hospital and you will be helped when it comes to diagnosis now the vertebrae are held together tightly, uh, tightly by ligaments so you will not just have this bone sitting on it and there is something holding this bone to the other there's another holding the first one to the third so the vertebral column therefore consists of five sets of these irregular bones so they are similar but if you look at it carefully we can identify five regions all right so the vertebral column has five regions please take note of this when it comes to the objectives five regions and they can list them for you to choose the appropriate answer 
the vertebral column like we said consists of five sets of similar bones so what are these similar bones the first one we said is called the cervical that forms the neck or the bones in the neck then we have the thoracic that is around the chest zone all right then you have the lumbar the upper abdominal region then we also have the caudal or the coccidial vertebrae that forms the tail region we shall be looking at them as you move further so showing on your screen is a typical picture of the vertebral column without the skull so you have only bones forming that narrow tube from the base of the head all the way to the tail there are sometimes uh, there are some questions that can easily be posed to you where they'll draw the regions for you to identify and also count the number of bones in those regions all right count the number of bones um, in those regions so the first part that connects the skull to the base of the neck is what you call the cervical vertebrae so the cervical vertebrae forms the first portion then the one that connects from the base of the cervical the base of the neck all the way through the chest area to the very back of the latter the last part of the um, the chest zone is what we call the thoracic region all right or the thoracic vertebrae and then connecting the thoracic vertebrae around the abdominal area all right to some somewhere around the lower or the back we are what to call the lumbar you see that those bones as you move from the top they are smaller they get bigger and bigger because the weights around that area is very high and you don't have bones in front to support them so they must look heavier and you also notice that the bone the vertebral column is not straight like a, a ruler it curves all right looking at the nature of the materials or the tissue around that zone so we have the we have the thoracic the lumbar then we have the sacral the waist the sacral um, vertebrae after which you have the coccyx or the coccidial bones so that constitutes the vertebral column well the first bone or the vertebral column is the atlas the one that starts the vertebral column is called the atlas so it is the atlas that carries the head all right atlas i'm sure it rings a bell green god okay who carries it it's believed that it carries uh, the planet or a sun so atlas the one of the strong bones doing that job and the second one that comes after the atlas is called the axis the axis that the atlas and the axis form part of the cervical vertebrae it's not only the atlas and the axis but you have atlas the axis and other bones forming the cervical vertebrae now let us look at the vertebral column and the number of bones there are for each region all right so we look at the vertebral column of human not for other animals but we are looking at humans so types of vertebrae we have the cervical that is the neck and you find it in um, in the neck region of the body how many are they they are seven in all but they start with the atlas the axis and then you have the remaining five coming then from that we have the thoracic vertebrae and you find them in the thorax or the chest region in all there are 12 and uh, you find them in that region well from that part you have the lumbar the lumbar they are very big around the stomach area and in you find them around the upper abdomen all right upper abdomen and there are five in number so around the waist or the lower abdominal region we have the set of vertebrae referred to as the sacral the sacral vertebrae there are five and then we have the caudal all right the caudal the caudal all right we have the caudal the caudal vertebrae all right and they form the tailbone and together they are four in number so we look at the structure again and it means that around this zone there are four all right and we have the five they have the seven they have the twelve so in all they should be about 33 33 all right so we move on to functions of the vertebral column functions of the vertebral column well the spinal cord is protected by the vertebral column so it's that tissue that white tissue when you are eating fish that white tissue is what you call the spinal cord the spinal cord is not your neck 
is that tissue that connects the brain to all parts of the body through the vertebral column and they provide joints for articulation with other bones such as the skull ribs pelvic and pectoral bones the vertebral column provides surfaces for the attachment of body muscles and they also give support or provide rigidity at the trunk all right so your body is sitting on the bones at the back but there's nothing there that's why they are huge and they give rigidity as well as support to the bone so let's look at the general characteristics of the vertebra all right the general we said uh, they are generally similar but from one region to the other the five regions they differ in terms of modification so all vertebrae in the vertebral column are built on the same basic form giving us a generalized or a typical vertebra and the various regions of the vertebral column differ in some features so the features help in the identification so that is why you, we, you hear us say that you have cervical we have thoracic then from thoracic you go to the lumbar then you have the sacral they have it is because they have slight modification so that separates those bones from that by in in all they have the same the bones are similar just that one is smaller or bigger or more projected than the other so the features help in the identification however the entire vertebrae have the following external common features so all vertebra all right all vertebrae they have the same features they all have what you call the centrum then you have what you call the neural arc we're we'll looking at the diagram very soon then you have the neural spine all right the projection then you have the transverse processes the anterior facet you have the anterior and posterior facets and in some books they call them the zygote prophecies so functions of the parts of the vertebra we are picking them one after the other and we state their functions so the centrum is the solid part of the floor of each vertebra it's a solid bone all right and it forms the floor of the vertebra it fits into the intervertebral disc on both sides so it's a small projection that fits into the intervertebral disc on both sides and it forms the floor of the neural canal and provides rigidity to the bone so let us look at a general vertebra so all bones are similar they look like this they have this projection referred to as a neural spine then you have what you call the transverse processes so we have the transverse processes the neural spine depending on the location may be very long or reduced all right and then we also have the facets all right that helps with articulation for the previous or the the one that comes after that bone so we have two of them the anterior and the posterior facets all right then we also have the centrum that solid part that's what i spoke about so this is a generalized bone you can be given a, a, a diagram of a generalized bone they will ask you to identify it as well as label the parts that is why we've painstakingly brought this for you to look at it and when you are faced with such a challenge you should be able to sail through it with ease and smile as well so from the center we move on to the the neural arc so this is a large central hole within the bone it provides a passage for the spinal cord so let's look at the diagram again we have the spinal cord running through that the, the solid bone and you have this region referred to as the, the neural arch or arch the neural spine is a bone that projects upwards so like i mentioned this one is a bone that projects upwards okay it projects upwards and the new it projects up above the neural arc and it's also the point for the attachment of muscles so muscles of the back or muscles of any portion of the body so we look at the transverse processes all right the transverse processes uh, processes so we say that they are the bones at the slide at the size of each vertebral uh, bone it is for the attachment of muscles so as you have those projections muscles are tattered and anytime you move is those muscles that allow you it's only it's not only one there are plenty all right for each bone so they collectively move you can turn twist and and dance it is for the attachment of muscles and they provide surfaces for the attachment also of muscles so we look at the facets we say we have two types the anterior and the posterior 
facets all right so these are the flat surfaces for articulation of successive vertebrae so we have several surfaces so if this bone wants to fit there's a portion that it fits all right and they are they form what we call the facets so if this is a bone you have facets above and you have facets also below so there are two types of facets for every vertebra and these are the anterior and the posterior facet anterior means above posterior means below or front and back mm -hmm. so we also have what you call the vertebrarial canal the vertebrarial canal so this is a structure which projects uh, blood vessels and nerves that passes through them and you find the vertebrarial canal often um, for the atlas as well as the axis so they have a separate hole again through which blood vessels um, are connected to the brain directly to supply the brain cells with nutrients okay so we call that part the vertebrarial canal other vertebrae do not have vertebrarial canal but the atlas and axis they do have what you call the vertebrarial canal and we also have what you call the odontoid process the odontoid process so this fits into the lower part of the neural canal of the atlas all right the neural canal of the atlas which allows rotation of the head so it means that the atlas vertebra has a portion where you have this projection from the skull that allows the head to move around all right from side to side and then there's another one that allows us to nod freely so we're looking at it okay so functions of the sternum so that to do for the vertebra uh, the vertebra or right, the generalized vertebra so apart from the skull and the vertebra column we also have some ribs all right joining to form the rib cage and they join the rib they join the the vertebra column but in front there there is a solid piece of bone called the breastbone or the sternum so we are looking at the sternum functions of the sternum it forms a cage which protects the lungs and the heart the ribs assist in the mechanism of breathing when pulled up and down by what you call the intercostal muscles so showing nicely on your screen is a picture of a rib cage but the emphasis is on the sternum the, the breastbone or the bone in front all right the breastbone so if you watch the ribs they are all curved they connect to the backbone and they curve to connect with the sternum so you have that curve all right the curve curve thing and together they form what you call the rib cage now the thoracic bone so now we want to look at the bones apart from the uh, the cervical so let's look at the thoracic bone so this is a bone which consists of two main parts namely the ribs so if you are looking at the thoracic so you have the ribs and you have the sternum or the breastbone the sternum or the breastbone so we start with the cervical vertebrae the very set that starts the vertebral column all right the very set that starts the vertebra we've described the the sternum and the rib forming the rib cage and i want to descend further into the various parts of the vertebral column so we start with the cervical so these are bones found in the neck they are seven in number like we mentioned earlier and differ from other vertebrae by having a vertebrarial canal which i described earlier on each side through which artery runs the first of the cervical vertebrae is called the atlas which has a hollow anterior facet which articulates with the skull and thereby allow movement of the head as nodding so you can nod anytime you are playing your favorite song and you nod always remember the atlas vertebra as well as the skull performing that function for you so you can nod the second uh, cervical vertebrae is the axis which has an odontoid process which fits into a groove all right it has a groove so there's a hole and the atlas fits into it and uh, of the neural canal for the atlas this allows for the rotation of the head so remember the atlas helps you to nod the axis helps you together with the atlas to move your head from side to side so showing on your screen is a picture of an atlas vertebra all right an atlas vertebra and we have this vertebrarial 
canals all right it carries the head naturally and these are the stretches we are looking at that allows you also to not freely so we have an axis vertebra all right an axis vertebra so the atlas sits on the axis and this is the projection we we're looking at that helps the head to move freely from one side to the other the atlas helps you to nod and the axis together with the atlas helps the head to move from side to side but don't forget they both have what to call the vertebral canal which sends blood all right allows blood vessels to run through sending blood or nutrient to the brain and bringing the residue back so we look at another picture of an axial skeleton consisting of the skull the vertebral column and the regions separated cervical thoracic lumbar the sacral and the coccyx all right the coccyx so move on to the thoracic vertebrae now these bones occur in the chest region of the body and there are 12 in man like i explained or we saw earlier they have long neural spines so we see now they are beginning to show their difference in the case of the cervical the neural spines are very reduced very very small but the thoracic vertebrae they have very long neural spines for attachment of muscle they also have facets for articulation with the ribs the cervical don't have facets for articulation with the ribs but the thoracic they have uh, uh, points for articulation with what the ribs and they have short transverse processes short transverse processes so we have shown on your screen a typical thoracic vertebra all right this is what you call the neural spine very very long in uh, the bones of the thoracic region and they also have more reduced transverse processes if you can see you notice that there's no intervertebral canal you don't have holes here but right? you don't have intervertebral canal so and the transverse processes are more reduced it's like a very long bone and a reduced structure so let's look at differences between a generalized vertebra and a thoracic vertebra so when they're asked to state at least two or three differences between a, uh, a general vertebra a generalized vertebra and a thoracic vertebra let us look at some of them so for the generalized vertebra it has a short neural spine that of the thoracic naturally have a long neural spine the generalized vertebra has a broad transverse process but in the case of the thoracic it's more reduced all right very very small and the generalized has what you call many projections from the, for attachment of ribs but in the case of the thoracic it has hollow areas for the attachment of ribs remember the generalized vertebra is not the same for all it's just that it's a summary of all the structures we have for all the vertebrae okay and then in the case of the generalized vertebra is relatively large size but that of the thoracic is very small or relatively small size and the century from the generalized vertebra is large but that of the thoracic vertebrae is very small so we move on to lumbar we've done cervical we've done thoracic we are moving on to lumbar all right the bones are the upper abdominal region of your body now they occur in the upper abdominal region there are five of them in humans and they have um stout centrum the centrum is very huge very rigid all right for attachment of muscles for the back the reason why they are big all right is that uh, you don't have rib cage uh, covering the viscera your intestines so the intestines and other structures in the abdomen are sitting on the the lumbar that's why it curves inside see the the creation there is very beautiful so they have these structures so this is a typical lumbar vertebra all right a typical lumbar vertebra so the centrum is large and rigid solid and huge all right you have transverse processes which are a bit longer than that of the the thoracic the neural spine is more reduced as compared to the thoracic and vertebra so sometimes they can put two bones for you they ask you to identify a these are the three, these are bones of the vertebral column identify them and state the differences sometimes they will not be asked to identify state the differences between the two diagrams so when they ask you to state the difference look at the neural spines of each maybe a and b the transverse processes the centrum the presence of vertebral canal all right and whether you have those facets for the uh, the odontoid 
all right for movement so we move on to the sacral vertebrae these are vertebrae found in the lower abdominal region of the body there are five in humans all right the sacral vertebrae is fused together to form the sacrum right they form the sacrum the region of the bone uh, in between uh, around the waist area and in between the pelvis at the upper part okay so it has articulating surfaces for the pelvic ghetto all right so like i said there are the points where you have the pelvic ghetto also attached that forms the cage um, for the lower part of the body to attach so we have the sacral vertebra you are not supposed to label the parts these parts have been labeled um, but you are supposed to just identify all right the sacral vertebra remember you have a lot of them also fused so move on to the caudal vertebra these are bones that forms the tail all right sometimes people wonder do humans have tail the answer is yes it's just that the our bones curves inwards so it doesn't project outside like the one that we have in the case of cats and dogs and they have their caudal vertebrae projecting our curves inwards and it's more more reduced extremely reduced so we don't see it but we all have it so there are four in humans and are fixed together to form the coccyx all right so they are fixed together to form the coccyx the neural spine of the caudal vertebrae provides surfaces for articulation with the tail muscles all right with the tail muscles so here showing on your screen i have the intervertebral disc which i mentioned that absorbs shock and then somewhere here we have the the coccyx all too soon the first part of our program is coming to an end this is the time to invite other friends to join us as we move on to the questions and answers area so for the first part we've described the skeleton we said it is the hard part of the body it consists of so many parts that perform several functions but the skeleton is mainly divided into two we have the axia and appendicular the axia consists of the skull and the vertebral column and we said the skull consists of fused bones forming the cranium protecting the brain and you have the snout all right with the upper mandibles or what we call the maxillae and then we have the lower jaw that helps in, that moves and helps us which you call the mandibles so we have the mandibles and we have the maxillae and we also describe the bones of the vertebral column and we said it starts with the cervical followed by the thoracic followed by the lumbar all right then you have the sacral they have the corda or the coccyx together they provide a tube they, pro they create a hollow through which the spinal cord travels and connects to all parts of the brain of all parts of the body so the brain can communicate um, with them we shall be looking at the questions and the answers and when we are done with this we move on to the problem of the day so like we said at the beginning of the class you can assess this information on all social media handles at joy learning tv go to youtube and go to facebook they are all there and should you uh, miss any part of this class you can assess it and then study from it and send us your comments as well as your questions we shall be glad to answer the questions with you so on this note we move on to our questions and answers questions and answers so on your screen we have projected some questions and we shall be looking at the questions so the first question reads draw and label a ray diagram to show how the image of a point object is seen in plain mirror is seen in plain mirror so draw and label a ray diagram to show how the image of a point object is seen in a plane mirror and the second part of the question reads state two characteristics of an image formed by a convex mirror when an object is placed in front of it and the, the, the third part reads explain why convex mirrors are preferred to play mirrors as driving mirrors so i'll give you some few seconds to digest the questions and then we shall together solve these beautiful questions so i'll give you three seconds or maybe five seconds 
to look at the questions make up your answers in your mind or you can jot them down and run along as we go through them so we move right away to the solution to this beautiful question so the question says that we should draw and label a ray diagram to show how the image of a point object is seen in a play mirror so it means you are going to draw a ray diagram to show how images are formed all right in a play mirror these are the things you are looking out for when you are drawing um, ray diagrams you must have a direction of the ray since this diagram is forming is an, a diagram that forms an image inside the mirror it means the image is virtual you can't touch it all right it's not real you can't touch it so the image was formed at the back so you have to indicate the rays where they are coming from and how the images are formed so you need a play mirror the play mirror is that straight line we have here mirrors are drawn using these side brushes all right to show that it's a mirror and the point object will release rays which will strike the surface of the mirror at a given angle and reflect into the eye or whoever is observing or the observer the observer sees the image inside the mirror all right at the same distance from the object so here if the object is two centimeters in front of the mirror the image will also be two centimeters away from the mirror inside the mirror so we say they exhibit equidistance all right from the mirror now the second part of the question demanded that or demands that we see two characteristics of an image formed by a convex mirror remember in the case of the play mirror the image is virtual the image distance is also equal to the object distance but the image is laterally inverted it means that the right hand side of the of the object will be the left hand side of the image just like how you see me on your screen all right but this question is on convex mirrors not play mirrors so let's look at the answer to this beautiful question so characteristics of images formed by convex mirrors characteristics of images formed by convex mirrors so one the image is virtual or not real all right so for convex mirrors their images are also virtual they are not real meaning it's formed inside the mirror you cannot touch it and the image is erect meaning it's upright okay it's standing like the way i'm standing it's upright so the image the object is sitting the image will be sitting if the object is standing the image too will be standing the image is diminished but it means that the image is smaller than the object the image is diminished or smaller than the object and the image is formed at the opposite side of the mirror all right the image is formed at the opposite side of the mirror and the last one the image is formed between the principal focus and the pole all right the principal focus and the pole of the mirror convex mirrors also have a wild field view so there was a question um the third part of the question explain why convex mirrors are preferred to play mirrors as driving mirrors so if you look at most cars um they don't use play mirrors they use convex mirrors as their, their side mirrors why do they prefer that one so we want to look at why we have that phenomenon around so they have a wide field of view and able to capture a wide area right it's not only for cars but even when you go to some shops you see those mirrors hanging there so if somebody is going to commit a crime everybody in the shop is captured there so you commit a crime when they catch you you will see yourself and then you explain why you did that so please don't don't do that anytime you go anywhere try to be disciplined now the the converse mirror also gives diminished images and is capable of forming most of the images of passengers which are which are which can be seen by the driver for security reasons so if the converse mirror is mounted inside the car i mean the car the, the mirror inside the car you will see the the driver can see everybody in the car all right and whatever you do you can be captured and the last one it gives an erect images all right even though the images are small 
the images are also erect okay so we move on to the second part of our question the second part we are doing questions and answers now possible questions and answers this is your favorite um, revision show integrated science revision show for shs on joy learning all right so we are looking at the second part we are looking at questions and answers which are capable of coming for our wasi which is coming our way very very soon we are praying for you we are supporting you and we know you make us proud just like those who did last year so our second question state the laws of reflection of light state the laws of reflection of light all right and then um the b part also reads uh, sorry on the plain mirror and the b part also reads state three characteristics of the images formed by a uh, plain mirror all right three characteristics all right so we are going to state the laws of reflection of light on a plain mirror what are the laws okay so i'll give you five seconds as usual five well so we'll do the countdown let's do 10 seconds form your answers on your, in your minds and let's see the answers that you have alongside what you have where you deviate it means you need further revision it means you need to read more all right so i'll give you some few seconds look at it carefully and let's solve it together let's solve it together stay the loss of reflection of light say three characteristics of the image form by a plain mirror all right the image formed by a plain mirror We'll give you some few seconds, look at it, and then we answer. Okay, so I'm sure by now you formed your answers, and there is the C part of the question. Explain why light bends when it moves from air into water. Why is it that when light enters water, it bends? So explain that one too. And D, describe the formation of a mirage. The formation of a mirage. Sometimes when you are on a very hot, uh, well tarred road, you will see something that looks like a pool of water on the surface of the road. That is what you call the mirage. How is it formed? And then define dispersion of light. Define dispersion of light. Define dispersion of light. And the last part, explain how rainbow is formed in the sky. We are now entering into the rainy season. So we'll be seeing rainbow. So we'll be sighting rainbows here and there. But don't forget, you can also form your rainbow using the mirror, water in the bowl. You form it on the wall. It's very nice. So I'll give you some few seconds again. Look at these questions. And then we'll start the A, B, C, D up to the F. Answer all of them. All right. Answer all of them. So we we'll move on to the solution. When we finish, we'll come back and look at the C, D, and F so that we can make up the question. So we have to state the laws of reflection. So we say that the laws of reflection states that the incident ray, the reflected ray, and the normal at the point of incidence all lie at the same plane. The incident ray, the reflected ray, and the normal at the point of incidence all lie in the same plane sometimes people tend to wonder what do you mean by the incident ray so if we have a plane mirror if there's a plane mirror and there's a light ray striking the surface of the plane mirror so this is a plane mirror all right now this is what we call the incident ray is coming from a point source or a light source and there is a normal a ray that is 90 degrees to the surface all right the same and it's going back now when this light strikes the plane mirror at that angle it will also reflect at the same angle so we call this ray the incident ray and the one that is 90 degrees or perpendicular to the surface of the mirror the normal and the ray that is moving away from that point that joint what is that point is what you call the point of incidence all right the point of incidence that is where the the rays meet so we call it the point of incident so the law says that the incident ray the reflected ray and the normal at the point of incidence they all lie in the same place so if this is the the inner part of the mirror 
all the rays are on the surface okay so they all lie on the same plane and then also the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of what reflection the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection the angle of incidence is the angle between the incident ray and the normal the angle of incidence is the angle of the the angle between the incident ray and the normal all right the and the normal the angle of incidence is the angle of um so here we have the ray and then we have what we call the incident ray now this forms the normal and that is the reflected ray this angle between the incident ray is what called the angle of incidence and the one that is between the reflected ray and the normal is what you call the angle of what reflection what the certain law is saying is that the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection all right of reflection so the incident ray the reflected ray and the normal at the point of incidence all lie in the same plane and the second law says that the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection all right it's always equal to the angle of reflection so these are the two laws of reflection and then we move on to the characteristics of images formed by a plane mirror the question is if you state three of them but let's look at the characteristics um, of images formed by a plane mirror so the first one we can say that the image is erect or upright when you stand in front of a mirror the way you stand is the same way your, your image is also standing and the image is virtual or behind the mirror so if you stand in front of a mirror you see yourself but yourself that you are seeing is not a real thing it's at the back of the mirror all right and the image is laterally inverted so if you stand again in front of a mirror and you extend your right hand you see that the right hand of the image is also is the same place so it's like the image has turned so we say it is laterally inverted all right laterally inverted the image has the same size as the object so the way you look is the same way your image will look the size is the same thing all right so the image size is the same as the object size and the image distance from the mirror is the same as the object distance from the mirror so the three characteristics they want you to state is uh, you can pick any of these three all right your the image is erect the image is virtual it means you can't touch it the image is laterally inverted all right and then the image distance is equal to the object distance and the image has the same size as the object so let's look at the c why light bends when it moves from air into water why is it that when light uh, moves from air into water it bends okay so if for example you put a coin uh, in a cup and you look at it at a distance it will look like the, the coin is closer to the surface than normal all right so in science you have what you call the real and apparent death very very deceptive because the light bends and it bends the bottom more closer but in reality it's not like that it's it's, a, it's a, an optical illusion right it's an optical illusion so why light bends when it moves from air into water air is less dense than water so in terms of their densities air is less dense than water and the velocity of light in air is greater than the velocity of light in water so based on the density as light travels from air into water or any other medium that is denser than the air the velocity or the speed reduces okay because of the density all right because of the density any ray passing from air into water will bend towards the normal all right so if you have a ray uh, traveling from air into water because the water is denser than the air you see the ray bending towards the normal but if the ray travels from a denser medium to a less dense medium, it bends away from the normal so if you have let's say two um two regions the upper part here is air okay and the lower part here is water you can have any other medium it could be a fluid and you have light let's say this is the normal you have light coming at an angle to strike the surface here remember this side this region here is the region above here is air and the region above there too is water you the, the light strikes the surface at an angle this angle okay and it's expected that for uh, 
playing mirrors it should be the same but upon entering the water we expect it to move all right away from the normal rather it moves towards the normal because it's more denser than um, the air but the other way around if you change it then it moves away from the normal so any way passing from air into water will bend towards the normal in water the ray bends away from its original path all right so we have a ray traveling at a at a particular trajectory then when it enters into a more denser medium it changes its trajectory that is what we call refraction it has changed its path right it has changed um, its path so we move on to the formation of a mirage how are mirages formed all right how is a mirage formed mirage appears during hot weather so for you to see a mirage then the weather must be very hot extremely hot and as the earth heats up it also warms the air above its surface all right and remember there will be a temperature gradient from the hotter part that is the air around the sun the, the, sorry, the, the air around the earth to the air far above the air so as we move further from the surface of the air the densities also change so it means we are going to have light changing path all right in that direction so let's see what happens so the mirage appears very hot weather. It appears on tarred roads when the ground becomes hot or on a sunny day. But on the desert too, you can observe the same thing. The air above the hot ground heats up as the ground becomes hotter. The air above the ground forms a column of layers of air with different temperatures. All right, and they have different temperatures. They have different densities. And you have different refractions of light so the layer above the ground is less dense with densities of the layer um, compared with uh, is less dense with the densities of compared with the densities of the layers increasing steadily from the ground above so as you move from the surface of the earth above the densities of the columns of air will be changing from high to medium to low all right and it means we have different refractions or different changes in parts of light when light rays from the atmosphere passes to the ground, so where the light is coming from the sun, all right, it suffers successive uh, refraction in the layer till it is refracted back into the atmosphere. An observer sees the image of the sky as a pool of water, all right, as a pool of water some distance in front of him on the ground. And this image of the sky on the ground is what you call the mirage, all right. So light comes from the sun as it comes and it's supposed to it bends towards the normal it bends towards the normal so you have that continuous bending and then when the light is also going back you have that also okay so it's kind of focuses the clouds bearing water up there on the on the surface of that hot uh, tarred road so you may think that there's water there and as you get there there's nothing all right that we say that is what we call the mirror so it's deceptive it's deceptive and sometimes it even kills animals on the desert where they think that there's water they get closer and there's no water and that even kills them because you spend a lot of energy working to get the water and they are not getting it so we move on to the the fifth part of the question which says that we should define dispersion of light what do you mean by dispersion of light so by definition it is the separation of white light into its component colors by refracting medium the separation of white light into its component colors by a refracting medium when you have white light incidented um, on a refracting surface or through even a glass when you incident light on a surface of a glass and in fact you see the various colors of light and that is in the if it's white light you form the rainbow all right if it's white light you form the rainbow but sometimes you may see dark patches that one is to be explained later in chemistry and physics under quantum and um, quantum chemistry and then quantum physics so the next question formation of rainbow in the sky all right how is the rainbow formed so from this you can easily tell that when light travels and enters into um a material of different density it separates into its various colors remember the light consists of several wavelengths of um, other electromagnetic radiation which have different wavelengths and frequencies so upon entering into a denser medium they separate into their, uh, their various frequencies or wavelengths and that is exactly what happens in the sky when it rains heavily 
the atmosphere becomes saturated with water droplets all right fog you have a lot of water droplets suspending in the air and as light strikes them it separates into their respective colors the red the orange the yellow the blue the green all right and then the indigo and the violet what you call the the raw diff all right so we have this the red the orange yellow green blue indigo violet and that is what constitutes the rainbow so in the formation of the rainbow raindrops suspends in the atmosphere disperse white light into different colors forming the rainbow all right so the raindrops performs this job of separating the white light into its various colors and that is what we call the rainbow all too soon we are done with question two we move on to question three the questions are becoming more exciting please look at the questions carefully and also form your answers alongside we'll be sharing more questions with you as we move on and this is the revision show on joy learning for shs uh, students so uh, you can still assess it on facebook as well as uh, youtube on joy learning tv i'm very glad also to share answers with you if you have questions or comments we'll address it as we move on so question three question number three this is not an uh, SMQ. all right question number three um, it, it reads state i one natural source of light i i one artificial source of light and then b what is a shadow c define refraction the refraction again and then d state the laws of refraction so here it means we have laws of refraction and we have laws of reflection so note the difference all right we'll be looking at it so we are answering questions on light questions on light i'll give you five to seven seconds to digest the question and then form your answers and together we solve it all right so we we'll look at the questions once again state one natural source of light one artificial source of light what is a shadow define refraction and then state the laws of refraction so we we'll move on straight away to the solution and we we'll look at the answers natural sources of light so when we say a natural source of light is simply a body that produces light on its own okay it generates light on its own so the natural source of light uh, we can have the sun we can have uh, stars all right we can also have some organisms generate light like the glow worms all right then you can also have the fireflies these are insects that you find them in the evening creating their own light they have certain cells that perform this and in the ocean there are so many animals that generates light in the night okay they generate their own light so we say they are natural sources of what light so we have the sun stars fireflies the glow worms etc and then the artificial sources of light uh, we can have the candle electric bulb all right and then the led light the light emitting diodes all right they are artificial they they cannot generate light on their own the things must be put together before the light comes out of them so what is a shadow a shadow a shadow so a shadow is an image formed of an object which lies in the path of light the image formed of an object which lies in the path of light so as light travels and it strikes an object that is opaque the light cannot penetrate it the image formed all right by that object in the path of light is what you call a shadow all right a shadow so when you see your shadow is because you have blocked the light from traveling so your image is formed wherever you are standing refraction of light is the change in the direction change in the direction of light when it travels from one medium to another all of different density the change in the direction of light when it travels from one medium to another all of different density so it means that the two media must be different in terms of characteristics all right in terms of their characteristics so d we are to state the laws of refraction the laws of refraction 
the laws of refraction. So let's look at the laws of refraction. The, the laws are very simple, just like the reflection, they are also very simple here too again. But let's see how different they are. The incident ray, the refracted ray, and the normal at the point of incidence all lie at the same plane. The incident ray, the refracted ray, at the point of incidence all lie at the same plane. So if you have two media, let's call this one maybe water medium, all right? Or uh, let, let's change it and make it. Um, we have two media. So this is water. Okay. We have water here. And then you have what you call a normal. That is a ray striking the surface at 90 degrees. And then we have an incident ray coming from this direction. Now, upon entering the water, it bends towards the normal, isn't it? So we say it has refracted. The incident ray, this one, the refracted ray, that one, and the normal at the point of incident, this point where they are all meeting, they all lie at the same point, all right? They lie at the same point. So it is similar to that of reflection, except that for reflection, it's on the same surface. But with this one, one ray enters into another uh, medium. So take note of that. And the ratio of the sign of the angle of incidence. Well, what do you mean by angle of the sign of incidence? So we'll look at it again here. We have this and we have that. The angle between the incident ray and the normal is called the incidence. And the angle between the refracted ray and the same normal is called the, what? the angle of refraction. So the, the law says that the ratio of the sign of the angle of incidence to the sign of the angle of refraction all right, it's always constant for any two given media. It's always constant. What well, that is what we call the refractive index. So in physics, we say that um, the angle of the sign of incident for maybe the medium A to the medium B, all right, um, will be equal to the sign of the angle. So sine I over sine R. We are looking at the sign of the angles of I and R the ratio will always be constant for the two media. So we can use that phenomenon to determine the refractive indices of materials. So we have that of glass, we have that of water, we have that of oil. That is light traveling from air to water, light traveling from water to glass, or whichever, whichever, whichever direction that you want to consider. But the media, the media must have, the, the media must be of different density. So the sign of the angle of incidence to the sign of the angle of refraction is always constant for any given pair of what media with different densities and that is very very useful when it comes to light and technology all right and it comes to light and technology as well so the ratio of the sign of the angle of incidence to the sign of the angle of refraction is constant for any two given media constant for any two given media so we are still moving on and we move on to question number four. Question number four. So question number four simply states, state one function each of the following parts of the human eye. All right, so the first two questions were on light. This one is on the eye, the human eye. All right, state one function of each of the following parts of the human eye. The pupil, the lens, then we have the retina, and then the vitreous humor. Okay, so we have the pupil, the lens, the retina, and the vitreous humor. Well, the eye is also known as the, an optical organ, all right? It converts light energy to electrical energy. And the eye that you see consists of a ball, all right, sitting in the socket, but it has layers around the ball. The one projecting outside that we see quite in front and continuous all the way to the back is what you call the conjunctiva in front here okay but it forms the sclera at the back and there are other layers inside you have what you call the aqueous humor the all right and then we have the vitreous humor the the fluid inside are dif different densities the one between the lens and the surface that's the surface of the eyeball projecting outside is what we call the aqueous and the one at the inner part is called the vitreous humor separating the two is the uh, the lens and the ciliary muscle allowing it to focus and then we also have 
the choroid, a dark region at the back, all right, and we also have the retina. So we'll be looking at, but on the retina, we have the fovea or the yellow spot. So the question is now asking us to state the functions of this part of this eye that I've just described briefly. The next, in our next class, we will look at functions of all the parts of the eye. So I'll give you five minutes to look at, uh, five minutes is too much, five seconds to look at it. And then uh, we we'll continue, all right, we we'll continue the story. So we we'll look at it and i give you five seconds look at it carefully and let us um, continue five seconds just five seconds all right five seconds all right so let's look at the solution the solution to the question the function of the pupil all right the function of the pupil well so this allows or regulates the amount of light entering the eye it allows or regulates the amount of light entering the eye the pupil is a very small you see um if you look at the eye it has a portion in front that screens of excess light all right called the iris and that hole through the light travels is what we call the pupil. So it controls how much light enters the eye, all right, to form um, images on the retina. And when the light is too high, the eye naturally will shut and the, the iris will constrict, reducing the size of the pupil so that you can see. So you see that when you enter a place of bright light, you naturally want to squint, you want to close your eye because the light is too bright. What controls how much light enters your eye? is the pupil now the second part of the question functions of the lens functions of the lens so the lens um, the lens that is the eye lens bends or refracts light on the retina it bends or refracts light on the retina it bends or refracts light on the on the retina then i i i functions of the retina now it is a site for formation of images the site for formation of images so i described that at the inner part of the eye there are certain cells specialized cells that receive the uh, the light from the outside of the image of the object and forms the images and it converts the light or the pattern to electrical energy which is transferred to the brain for processing and then IV functions of the vitreous humor. I mentioned the aqueous and the vitreous humor. The vitreous humor helps to maintain pressure in the eyeball or maintains the shape of the eyeball. So for the eyeball to be round, it, it is maintained by those fluids inside the, the eye. And that performs that job of maintaining the shape of the eyeball. And the last one is that the vitreous humor also helps to refract light passing through the eyeball. So it also performs the job of refraction but, and also keeps the shape of the eye um, in check. It also contains what we call phagocytes, which keeps the visual axis clear most of the times. There are certain cells that remove those suspending structures in the eye. We call them phagocytes. And it keeps free radicals from damaging the lens all right free radicals from damaging the lens so soon we are done with four questions and we move on to the fifth question but uh, we shall be going briefly for a commercial break and that's the time to invite a friend so that you can also relax stretch your legs and then we'll come back again and continue the concept of our revision show for integrated science um, uh, for SHS on joy learning. But whilst we, before we go for the break, look at the questions that we've displayed. What is a joint? All right, name three components of a typical joint and then state the functions of the mammalian skeleton. Mm -hmm. State the functions of the mammalian skeleton. So we shall be back very soon and we shall continue solving these questions.
examination malpractice is any form of deliberate cheating on examinations which provides one or more candidates with an unfair advantage or disadvantage. It is an illegal act and can be perpetrated by a single individual or groups. It can occur outside or inside the classroom. So before you enter the exams hall, make sure you follow these instructions. 1. Empty your pockets and avoid entering with a foreign material. That is smuggling of answer scripts. 2. Avoid writing on sheets of papers, handkerchiefs, erasers, covers of calculators, and on the skin. Remember not to fall victim to any examination more practices so you could have a peaceful examination. Prepare well and we wish you all the best. Joy learning. Keep learning. It's time to wish your loved ones well on that special occasion. Is it the birthday or anniversary of your child, friend, classmate, your schoolmate, your teacher, or non-teaching staff of your school? The all-new JL Birthday Wish by Ghana's number one educational TV channel hits your regular classroom screen. And as usual, it is time for Jack to play and have fun. It has been made easy for you and this is how. Send a picture of your loved ones, add their names, school, and location, and a heartwarming birthday message and finally follow us on official joy learning tv on instagram like the jl birthday wish post and tag five friends send it to our whatsapp line 0247 108 738 and voila your birthday wish will be aired on joy learning tv and all our social media platforms learning is made fun with the jl birthday wish joy learning keep learning Help me, I can't hear anything. Examination malpractice is any form of deliberate cheating on examinations which provides one or more candidates with an unfair advantage or disadvantage. It is an illegal act and can be perpetrated by a single individual or groups. It can occur outside or inside the classroom. So before you enter the exams hall, make sure you follow these instructions. 1. Empty your pockets and avoid entering with a foreign material. That is smuggling of answer scripts. 2. Avoid writing on sheets of papers, handkerchiefs, erasers, covers of calculators, and on the skin. Remember not to fall victim to any examination more practices so you could have a peaceful examination. Prepare well and we wish you all the best. Joy learning. Keep learning. Welcome back. So soon, our time is getting closer to the end of our program. I am George Loco, your facilitator for today's Integrated Science Show for SHS on Joy Learning. So far, we have been looking at three components of this section. We have a theory which we date the skeleton, and then we'll be solving questions. Our time is almost up, so we want to open the lines so that our students who saw our problem of the day will be able to answer the questions that were flying on the various social media handles. So we will be looking at our problem of the day. Problem of the day. The problem that gives you an award and you shall be duly recognized. So our question reads, Outline six steps leading to the electrolytic extraction of aluminium. Outline six steps leading to the electrolytic extraction of aluminium from its all. And this question is picked from a topic called exploitation of metals. Exploitation of metals. 
so on our screen on your screen a number has been displayed below the question 0302 or 706 if you have answer to the question bring your answer the first person to win gets the question uh, the, the reward A problem of the day. The uh, numbers have been projected on your screen. Those of you who did the research work, or those of you who have read and you want to display, bring it on. Let's see your solution. If you win, we'll give you the award involved. However, you can get all that you have done today on all the social media handles at Joy Learning TV, YouTube, Facebook, any of the social media handles. And we shall also be glad to hear from you in terms of comments. And if you have questions, we are also ready to share the answers with you. All right, so we move on. And we have problem of the day. We shall give you some few minutes. Uh, one minute will be okay. If we don't get any call coming through, we will solve it. And we will keep our reward. In fact, I will reward myself. <laughs> I will reward myself. So we are still waiting for answers to the question. Otherwise, we'll answer it, and in our next class, we attempt another problem of the day. So showing on your screen are the numbers that you can call into this show. We have 0302, 0302, 211, 211, 705, 705 or 706. Hello, Ganyu. Welcome to the Integrated Science for SHS. Oh, we lost Ganil. Ganil, call back. We are ready to receive your answer and give you the award if you get it. So the numbers are still there 0302 You know, sometimes we'll be having problems with the networks, but keep trying. It will come through, we'll pick it, and then you will get the, uh, the reward we have for you. The numbers are still showing. 0302, you have 211, 705, or 706. So in the next five seconds, if we are not able to connect with you, then we shall bring the answer. and. In the next section, there will be another problem of the day. So always look out for the problem. Now, this show is running for now to, um, I think, three weeks or four weeks. Welcome, Steven, to... Well, we lost Steven again. The network is having a problem. It's not for my end. I'm sure it's general network. So keep trying. You will be able to connect through. Well, since we're having challenges with... Um, our learners, since we are having challenges with uh, the lines, we want to present the answer to the question. So those of you who are not able to connect with us, try your luck another time. So the question reads, outline six steps leading to the electrolytic extraction of aluminum from its own. And the question is on exploitation of metals. So let's look at the question. Steps involved in electrolytic extraction of aluminum. The first is heating or roasting of bauxite or or to convert iron 2 oxides to iron 3 oxide. So you have to roast it so that if you have iron 2 oxides in it, it will be converted to iron 3. Alright. Then you crush or grind the roasted bauxite to powder. You crush or you grind the roasted bauxite to powder. And then dissolution of the powdered bauxite in hot concentrated pseudo hydroxide solution or boiling powdered bauxite 
with sodium hydroxide solution. So, so, so you roast. It is you. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to Integrated Science Live Show. I'm sure you have an answer to the problem of the day. So go ahead. Tell us what you have. Hello, Idris, we are listening. Okay, sir. Okay, go ahead. Well, Idris, whose line 2 has dropped, unfortunately, uh, the, yeah, there's a challenge with the network, I, I suppose. Uh, so we shall continue with the solution, and if we finish, I'll award myself. All right, uh, because I solved the question, so I need to award myself. So, the solution of the powdered bauxite in hot concentrated sodium hydroxide solution or boiling powdered bauxite with sodium hydroxide solution. And then the next step is the ion 3 oxide or impurities are removed by filtration. So first, you crush the oil, you roast it, and then it converts it. If there's ion trap, it converts it to ion 3 and other oxides are converted. Then you dissolve the bauxite in hot concentrated sodium hydroxide. The iron oxide will not dissolve. So you now filter. So you have filtration. After the filtration, you have addition of freshly prepared aluminum hydroxide from sodium aluminate um, to form sodium aluminate solution. Then you filter the mixture. So you have what you call precipitation of the aluminum hydroxide. Then you filter again. After which you wash the residue thoroughly. Where the residue is the solid that you are interested in and the filtrate is what you don't need but the filtrate is also rich in sodium hydroxide so you dry the solid sample which is the aluminum hydroxide and then you heat or you will to form the alumina well after that you carry out the electrolysis of the alumina all right in the whole cell all too soon problem of the day has also been solved we are at the end of our concept of this revision show. And like I said, today we did three sections. We did the skeleton, we answered questions, and we have also answered the problem of the day. So with the skeleton, we did the entire skeleton. We said the skeleton is the hard part of the human body. It has several parts that perform specific functions. With the skeleton, we can divide it into three main regions the axial and the appendicular the axial consists of the skull and the vertebral column the appendicular consists of the limbs and the girdle the pectoral and the pelvic girdles and we said the skeleton helps us with movement it provides series of joints for movement it also produces blood it supports and protects delicate organs so from there we went on to talk about the vertebral column we said it is simply uh, an arrangement of um, rigid bones with hollow with hollows in, inside them forming a column all right through which the spinal cord runs we have five sections associated with it the cervical the thoracic the lumbar the sacra and the caudal or the coccyx so we also mention the generalized vertebra and how it is related to the other portions of the vertebra we said that with the cervical we have two types of bones which are unique the atlas carried carrying the, the skull directly and the axis which comes after the the atlas the atlas helps us to to nod but the axis helps the head to move freely because of the odontoid process and then we also have the atlas and um, we have the thoracic vertebrae which have a very long neural spine for the attachment of the back muscles and it also has structures or facets that connect the ribs to the sternum. All right, and we said together they form what we call the rib cage that helps in breathing. So another function of the skeletal system in man is that it is in breathing. Then we also looked at the lumbar uh, vertebra or the lumbar vertebrae, which are very large with huge centrum, and they are separated by the intervertebral disc. But another feature that we saw in the course of the concept was the intervertebral canal, the vertebral canal, which is associated with only the cervical vertebra. From there, we went on to the caudal and the bones which articulate with the bones of the pelvic girdle. From here, we went on to 
the questions we solved quite a, a, a number of questions and we solved the problem of the day if you were not able to watch this program you can go on joy learning tv on any uh, any of the social media handle particularly uh, youtube and facebook and you can assess the the video there we'll be very glad to receive your comments as well as questions that you have to share your answers with the uh, the other learners and the next time to the problem of the day always be on the lookout because it comes with a huge award which will be given to you i am george local your facilitator from st mary's senior high until we meet the next time keep learning on joy learning tv